This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I will talk uh, about Iraq and its relation with the United States, and then I will talk about the United Nations and Iraq at the United Nations. And then I will open the floor because I'm sure you have certain things in your mind to ask about and certain comments. I would like also to listen to, to your views about what you feel, uh, what happened in Iraq uh, after 2003 and uh, during Saddam regime time, and there is a big, still big debate about what happened. Iraq is very well known in the whole world as the cradle of civilization. And the oldest uh, discovered civilization in the world was in southern Iraq, in, in Sumeria, in southern Iraq. And when you read Genesis, which is the first chapter in the Old Testament, it says the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve lived, had four rivers. Two of them are the Tigris and Euphrates. And there is only one country in the world with these two names until today, which is Iraq. So according to Genesis, Adam and Eve lived in southern Iraq in, in uh, Sumeria. And Ur, which is in the same area, is the birthplace of Prophet Abraham. This is why the Pope accepted an invitation to visit Ur. And recently, um, a British archaeologist discovered a city in Ur big city, he believed it was the town uh, where Abraham lived and, and at that time. We're talking about thousands of years ago. And then Babylon in the center of Iraq is very well known as a Babylonian civilization. And to the north, we have uh, what we call Assyrian civilization. And the Assyrian people just, uh, celebrated 21st of March this year, the 6,700 23 years, so it's almost 7,000 years calendar. And I can't uh, see any other calendar similar to that one. Maya civilization is a few thousand years old, but it's not um, as long as 7,000 years. And the Assyrian became Christian when Jesus came with his, uh, his, his message. Until today, we have the Assyrian, the largest number of, of um, we have Christian from all different uh, um, sex, but the Assyrian um, Iraqi Christian are the oldest, they are the original, the indigenous people in Iraq. We still have churches which go back to that time of, of, uh, of um, the, the history. And Saddam demolished some of these historical churches when he oppressed the Christians and he killed some of the priests who stood against him. Saddam killed even members of his families, his family. Um, two sons-in-law and a cousin and a brother-in-law because they stood against him and say no. He was a brutal dictatorship who oppressed almost everybody in Iraq. So what you hear today in the media that in Iraq there are Sunnis and Shiites, there are Kurds, Arabs, Turkmen, there are Muslims and the Christian, Jews, Sabian, Yazidis, all these components lived in peace and harmony for centuries. But Saddam play on the differences, ethnic differences, sectarian differences, religious differences, for a simple reason. When he fought the Kurds in northern Iraq, and the Kurds, they have national rights, and Saddam was uh, a, a leader of a Ba'ath, a socialist Arab party, so he was a nationalist. So he tried to wipe the Kurds, use chemical weapons against them. He had a campaign. In one campaign, he arrested 182,000, and they disappeared. All of them. Chemical weapons was used in the largest attack since the First World War in 1988. In one town called Halabja, 5,000 people were killed in one day time. More than 10,000 was injured. 
And um, when um, scientists went to that city and they make studies, until today, there was a professor in Liverpool University, Christine Gosden. She discovered that the results of these chemical weapons on humans that uh, women have miscarriages, high, much higher level of miscarriages. Um, they have deformed babies. And there are very strange kind of cancers which start to spread because of the chemical weapons. The effect of these weapons continue for decades. Even the water and the soil was contaminated. Uh, and uh, at one stage when the Kurds start to negotiate with Saddam regime, uh, they, when they try to go back and be part of, of the rule of Baghdad, he said, what's your demand? They said, you arrested 182,000. What happened to them? And his cousin, Ali Hassan al-Majid, who was very well known of being called Chemical Ali because he ordered the using of chemical, said, don't exaggerate. They were only 120,000. <laughs> they said, OK, you arrested 8,000 of one tribe, which is Barazani tribe. Barazani was the leader of the Kurdish movement. They said, don't ask about them. So they said, if we don't ask about 120, say not 182, because it's, it's exaggeration. If we can't ask about 8,000, if we can't. So what, what we are talking about? He said, oh, you have one right. What is our right? To cry about uh, the province which you claim, which is Kirkuk. This is your right. When you pass Kirkuk, you can only cry. And then they said, oh, thank you. This is very, uh, a very important privilege, because you prevent the Shiite from crying when they cry the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, who is the grandson of Prophet in Karbala, who was massacred with his family and his companions back in the history. You didn't allow them even to mourn. So by giving us the privilege to cry, this is, this is a big, big um, uh, you know, interest and benefit you are giving us. So Saddam th thought he could rule the country by extreme brutality, by killing everybody, uh, imprisoning everybody who just raised a voice. And he used unbelievable ways. Publicly, he was cutting the tongue whoever criticized Saddam, his family, the Ba'ath Party, and the government. And we have it on videos, by the way, but we can't show it to the world. They, cut, they, they, they catch the tongue with a pair of plices, and they cut it with a, a razor. He cut the ears of deserters from the army. And I saw with my, my own eyes people having their two ears cut. And um, they cut the hand, and they show it in that somebody was in the hospital, and the hand was cut. But they put it in a plate beside his bed, and they show it on TV. All those crimes were documented. While I was in London, I was part of an organization chaired by a British MP, Anne Clewid. And we were collecting evidence about Saddam crimes. So I went to many countries, I interviewed those, either the prisoners or those who were punished or those who escaped. And they were horrific stories. You don't believe that in such a time in the history that a dictator do all that. There were 51 laws which sent us people to execution because they either criticized the government or criticized the president or his son or his family. So when I was only 22 years old, I was imprisoned because I went to a funeral of five people who were executed by the regime, and one of them was in my neighborhood. So I knew he was executed. We were to take, went to take the bodies to bury them, and then they arrested me to say, oh, you were planning to have a demonstration against the government. I said, no, we were going to have a funeral. No, no, no. Don't you know these people were executed? So what? That means they are against the regime. That means you are supporting people against the regime, which means you are part of a secret organization. You try to topple the regime. And I knew at that time, if I confess, then I will die. So I said, inside myself, I couldn't say that to them. I will not confess, no matter what. They tortured me, they beated me, and then they said, we're going to break your will. We will break your back. Because if we break your hand, you can walk. If we break your leg, you can crawl. But if we break your back, you can't 
move anymore, and then you will confess. And since then, I've been suffering from my, I, I'm still wearing a vest with some metal in the back because um, all my life I lived with this back problem. I had even a surgery in England. They told me, you have to live with it. You know, we will never go back to a normal person once you are tortured in the way you were tortured. However, uh, as Bill mentioned, I managed to um, get out because there was no evidence whatsoever that I did something wrong. And then I decided that I should stand against this dictatorship, no matter of what. I told my family, but do you know what? My mother was such a courageous hero that she stood, my father was crying, begging me not to involve in politics. He said, I don't want to see you arrested. I said, if I keep silent and everybody keeps silent, who will defend those who are oppressed? When I was in prison, I was always feeling that somebody outside Iraq could help. Somebody outside the prison could help because I can't do anything inside the prison. But my mother encouraged me. She is the hero of my life. Later on, she was helping me hiding secret papers. She was risking her life and the whole family because Saddam killed members of a complete family. Some families lost 30, 40, up to 70 members of the family were wiped out because they opposed the regime. She was helping me, she was encouraging me. And when I left Iraq to England, the first group, 10 members of my family were arrested. Three were executed, a brother-in-law and two cousins. And they forced my mother and my sister, whose husband was executed, to take the bodies. They didn't allow any male member of the family to take the bodies, just in case if it will turn to a demonstration against the regime. So only my mother, only my sister, took the three bodies to bury them. And in another go, they arrested a cousin and an uncle, and they vanish. No bodies, no document. The oppression was so bad that if a member of the family executed and they hand over the body, they say, thanks God, we have the body and we know the fate of our son. Otherwise, as a two of my family member, this appeared completely, nobody, no document. And the worst thing, that the wife cannot say, I am a widow, because there is no proof of death, there is no death certificate. And the children, the orphans, cannot prove anything. The father disappeared and the government denied that they took him and they executed him. Until today, we are searching for missing Kuwaitis. Saddam took 6,500 Kuwaitis after the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. The majority of them were released during the popular uprising which followed the invasion and the liberation of Kuwait. However, he kept 650 of them and Kuwait the West, US, Europe, United States try to know what happened to them. Saddam deny he took any of them. And what we discover after 2003, that he killed all of them. Men, women, children, military, civilians. He was picking them from the streets. His forces was picking them from the street, and they killed all of them. We're trying to find the bodies, the remains of these missing Kuwaitis so we can return them to their families. And we managed only to discover 238 bodies and we returned them to Kuwait. And the rest are still don't know what happened to their beloved one. Why on earth Saddam go to a neighboring country, invade that country because it's a small to say this is part of Iraq. This is a province of many provinces in Iraq and to wipe the people and to kill whoever say a word. Do you know, in the documents, I can't take a long time, and I don't want to do that. In the documents, we found that they arrested a child with his mother because he was holding the Kuwaiti flag. A child holding the Kuwaiti flag being arrested, they transferred from one place to another just because a child was having uh, the original Kuwaiti flag because Kuwait became part of Iraq after the invasion. And after the invasion, Security Council in the United Nations, which is in charge of peace and security, consider Iraq as a threat to peace and security. More than 80 resolutions were adopted against Iraq. 
73 of them under Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 is the only charter, only chapter in the UN Charter which authorized the Security Council to use force. Because when Saddam invaded Kuwait, they warned him. They told him to withdraw. He refused. Then they have to set up an alliance to remove Saddam from Kuwait. Without Chapter 7, then the Security Council, the U.S. wouldn't be able to build that kind of alliance to remove Saddam out of, out of Kuwait. And after the invasion, the people rose up against Saddam. They liberated 14 out of 18 provinces in the south and the north. And then Saddam suppressed this uprising with extreme brutality. He used tanks, artillery, helicopters, and he killed 500,000 Iraqis. This is according to Iraqi sources and American sources. So when United States decided to remove Saddam regime in 2003, I know many Americans say we shouldn't have gone to Iraq. We shouldn't have removed Saddam regime. This is a war of choice, unlike the war in Afghanistan, which was uh, a must. But from my perspective, and I wrote that in my book, that we have responsibility, we are humans. And if we don't stand against dictatorships, and if we don't stand for human rights, if you don't care about people who suffer in many parts of the world, we will be responsible. If we support a dictator, we'll be sharing his crime, we'll be supporting his crime. If we keep silent, that means we are happy. It means that we are accepting his crimes. If your neighbor house is on fire, you don't care. Is this some kind of a positive or a right position? No, of course. You know, when you read the, again, the holy books, the Quran, the Bible, the Torah, all of them said, oh, human beings, we created you from one man and woman, who are Adam and Eve, of course. And all of them talk about the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve live. So we are one big family. We are brothers and sisters. If we don't care about our brothers and sisters, we are not humans. The best humans are those who try to help others. You can live, you can enjoy life, but if you don't care about other people, you don't have feeling. If you care about your family, if you care about your children, you should care about your neighbor. And again, in the holy book said you should love your neighbor as much as you love your family. Why? Because God created all of us, and God treat all of us as equal, and God tell us that we are one big family. Therefore, when I meet you for the first time, I immediately believe that you relate to me. And I meet some people and say, oh, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in holy books. We believe in science. OK, OK, OK. All right. You believe in science? Do you know that science and scientists prove through DNA tests that around 7 million people live today in different continents, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, they go back to one man and one woman. They have a, a family tree of these seven million people, and they prove that they go back to one man and one woman. So if seven million people go back to one man and woman in the history, the seven billion people in the world now go back to Adam and Eve. This is scientific proof nobody could deny if you don't believe in the holy books. And if you believe in the holy books, go and read all of them. And by the way, I read all of them. And I'm writing a book after I published the 14 books I published about politics. The first time in my life I enjoy this book much more than anything. And I keep saying, God, let me finish this book. And then if you want me to die, I don't mind. Because this book is telling you how these holy books are so similar. Sometimes they use the same words, the same sentences. 
And this gives us the same message from the same God we worship, whether we go to a mosque, to a church, a synagogue, or a temple, because there's only one God who created all of us. And in these holy books, it says if there were more than one God, they will fight, just like presidents and leaders. <laughs> so logically, there is one God who runs this universe in such a unique way. You see, now we have wars everywhere. You see that we have a threat every day with nuclear weapons. Do you know what nuclear weapons mean? If chemical weapons kill the humans, contaminate water and soil, injured so many people with horrific injuries, so what, chemi what nuclear weapons could do for us all? So we fight all the time, although we are brothers and sisters. And the best way, I believe, this is why I'm writing this book. The best message I could get to everybody in the world that when you kill others, you are killing your brothers and sisters. And you are not allowed to hurt anybody, let alone to kill anybody. And it's stated in all these books that the biggest sin you can commit in your life is to hurt others or to kill others. And the Quran is very clear, whoever killed one single innocent person, he will be in hellfire forever. Very clear. So those extremists and those terrorists who justify killing others, they misinterpret these holy books and they kill under the name of religion. They kill under the name of God. And God cannot accept anybody who hurt others. Says the best people are those who help others, are those who care about others. My mother was forced three times to be on TV, Iraqi TV when I was in London. They try to get a word of her to criticize me. She never did. I believe she was so strong. She was stronger than thousands and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who either decide to be with the regime for benefit and interest or decide to keep silent just to be safe. She risked her life. She risked her family life because she felt that she should stand against dictatorship. And do you know what? When I went back to Iraq and when I have my brother kidnapped for three months and tortured and then killed, and the killers left a small note, a paper saying, this is the fate of traitors and agents. So they consider him as a traitor to Iraq and American agent, by the way. I was considered as American agent just because I tried to rebuild Iraq after 2003. Al-Qaeda publicly was saying that we will kill every Iraqi who is in the government, including a policeman or a small, low-level employee in the government because they helped the new government which was brought by the Americans. So when I came to New York, I force every single member of my family to leave Iraq. I said, if you stay, you will be killed. I know that. Except my mother, who said, I will stay in my house until I die. I said, how are you going to survive? She said, I bring a poor family to live with me. I will take care of the poor family by living in a house. They will take care of me. I said, mom, they will kill you in one day time, two days time. Why don't you want to leave Iraq? She said, son, I had two widows, daughters. I have orphans. I want to build a charity to take care of Iraqi widows and orphans. Oh, wow. She is much advanced thinking of me. She is old. She should think of having rest, enjoy life in the last years of her life. And she's thinking of something for the life after, for her real future, after she die. And she's, by the way, over eight years now, old. I said, okay, mom, I will have a deal for you. You go to Jordan to live with my brother and sister, I will build the charity you like. So we bought a house, we demolished the house, we built the house, but believe it or not, now she spent more than six months in Iraq taking care of the charity. Mom, my deal with you was you leave Iraq and I build the charity. You are spending more than six months in Iraq, and I'm worried every time you are in Iraq, something could happen to you. She says, son, if I don't care about the charity, who will do? 
And they have a couple of things. Oh, I need more electricity. I need to build the fence. I want to do this, maintenance. OK, 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 OK. And I told my brother Jordan, give her whatever she wants, and I will send you the money. Such a hero, a woman, a mother, she inspired me. And I'm sure so, uh, there are so many mothers all over the world who inspire their sons and husbands to fight against oppression, to stand against dictatorship. This is a good example for um, humans who care about others, who doesn't think of just eating and drinking and sleeping and having other desires, because all animals fulfill these desires. And we are humans. We have to think of other people. We have to help other people as much as we can. Now, since my arrival in the UN, I had the mission of getting Iraq out of 73 resolutions under Chapter 7. And Iraq was under sanctions, so Iraq couldn't export oil. Iraq couldn't import so many things, even materials for uh, civilian use, because they called them dual usage materials. Believe me or not, some chemical materials used in paintings and pants, they were not allowed. So I had this mission, and I struggled. It took me many years. And one of the commission was called Inmovic, which was in charge of dismantling weapons of mass destruction, had $140 million of Iraqi money sitting in their account. And when I went to the guy who was in charge of this commission, I said, what do you intend to do? He said, we have to go to Iraq to search, to make sure Iraq is free of WMD, and then we write a report to the Security Council to leave the sanctions. That was back in 2006 when I arrived. I said, why don't you go to Iraq? He said, no, Iraq is too risky. We cannot go. How much you are spending? We are spending between one and two million a month. Why? Oh, we have to keep up our expertise. So we have seminars in Europe, in Geneva, in Switzerland. Um, this is our money. He said, no, it's not your money. This is our money. My God. Anyway, in 2007, I managed to convince the Security Council to terminate Enmovic, and we managed to retrieve $140 million. Another example, and I will stop because there are so many examples. We had an oil for food program. So uh, Iraq could, after five, six years of the invasion in 1996, Iraq could ac uh, export certain quantity of oil, and the money will go to a French bank selected by Saddam himself, which called BNB Paribas. And then this money will spend only for food and medicine. They had $1 billion sitting in the account after Saddam regime fall. So I came with $1 billion. And the Security Council wanted to send a letter to Iraq to say, within 45 days, either you pay hundreds of millions to companies, or we'll pay them without any documentations. And I had to run and struggle and contact governments and members of the Security Council and the Iraqi government to stop that. However, in 2010, December 15, 2010, Security Council held a, a session and it was the presidency of the United States. Vice President Joe Biden came to New York and the Security Council decided to lift sanctions against Iraq and to end this oil for food program. We retrieved $656 million in one go we paid 300 million as compensation, and we still have 130 million in the UN just for future claims, if there are any, until 2016. And believe it or not, the UN are still pushing us, pressuring us to put more money, although the Security Council resolution said 130 million, and to go beyond 2016. And at the last minute, they told me, what if a company come after 2016 claiming money? What if the 130 million is not enough? I said, if this happened, we go to the Security Council, who decide to put 130 million, who decide 2016, to extend the time or the money. So you see that um, Iraq and Iraqi money was wasted in a way 
that is unbelievable because hundreds of billions of dollars of Iraq and Iraqi people were wasted either by manufactured weapons or dismantling weapons on our expenses. So Saddam spent billions of dollars to build a nuclear, chemical, and biological we uh, weapons program. He spent billions of dollars, and we spent billions destroying them. And then one guy who was Saddam aide living in Switzerland, in one bank account, he had cash, $300 million. And we managed through Security Council to freeze these 300 million. But until today, we couldn't get them back because he went to a European court. He went, first of all, to a Swiss court saying this is his money. We proved that it wasn't his money. This is Iraqi people's money. He went to the U.S. and to the U.N. to convince the U.S. government and the U.N. committee that this money belonged to him, and they were not convinced. And lastly, he went to European Human Rights Court to say, this is my money, and we have a battle until today. Once he lose this last attempt, then the, this $300 million will go back to Iraq. Now, to your information, Iraqi dinar used to be $3.3 from the beginning of the 20th century until Saddam started Iraq-Iran war in 1980. Because Iraq is rich with oil and gas, minerals and water, and all kinds of natural and human resources. So when I was born in a family from middle class business people, my family could offer to send my uncle to England, my brother to England. My father um, took his father, my grandfather, to London for medical treatment in 1955. He imported his new Ford American car in 1958. He imported his new Mercedes from Germany in 1966 because the Iraqi dinar was $3.3. So if a family was making um, 3,000 Iraqi dinar, it would be 10,000 US dollars. And you're talking about 1950s, 1960s in Iraq. Life was so cheap. Do you know how much the Iraqi dinar became after Saddam took over? and become president in 1979 and start the first war and then the second invasion of Kuwait, the second war, and 3,000 Iraqi dinar equal to one dollar. And sometimes 4,000, sometimes 5,000 Iraqi dinar. So the Iraqi dinar went from being 3.3 dollars to more than 10 to 15,000 devaluation because there's no oil, there's no cover for the currency. The currency worth nothing. And Saddam was printing Iraqi dinar because he had war. He needed to buy. So he was printing papers, which has no cover. So an average Iraqi family lived under Saddam rule between 1979 until 2003 for a salary which worth half a dollar, one dollar a month. What you can buy, what you can afford with one dollar, believe so I went back, I saw Iraq was destructed much more worse than when I left Iraq 24 years earlier. Iraq was one of the poorest countries in the world, much poorer than African countries. And this is why I say when Saddam was overthrown by the U.S., thanks to the U.S. government and U.S. troops and other allies, of course, like UK, Italy, Spain, Australia, many countries sent troops to remove Saddam regime. I can assure you and I can convince anybody that it's not only Iraq, but the region and the world is much better off with, without Saddam. If Saddam stay in power and we have any problem now, he could threat the oil overflow to the West, to the U.S. So those who say we shouldn't go to Iraq and Saddam should stay, that means we will have massacres every day until today. That means Saddam will keep threatening his neighbors, especially small Gulf countries, and human rights violation will continue every day. Now, if we allow killing of other people every day and we don't care and we keep silent and we say, why well, we should interfere? I don't believe that uh, this is the right position. 
But that doesn't mean we didn't do mistakes because we are humans. There's no perfection in this world. Everybody did mistakes. But the most important issue is to learn from our mistakes. We are humans. We Iraqis committed mistakes. Americans did some mistakes. The British did mistakes. But we have to learn. We have to learn how to have a better world, a safer world. Without learning from our lessons in our lives, we'll continue repeating the same mistakes. Now, for your information, Iraq is rich. We manage now to export almost 3 million barrels of oil every day. It's our budget which start with 12 billion in 2003 and 30 billion in 2005. This year is around 140 billion. And we intend to go up with exporting of oil up to 10, 12 million barrel. We have the capacity, but we need time. We need investments. And the high prices of oil help us. The market needs those quantities of oil. Because the oil now is over 100, around 100 dollars. So it's go down to 80, 70, 60. That's still acceptable level of price. We still be able to sell oil. The market will need it. And then we can rebuild our country. Building our country, we need everything. The infrastructure was built in the beginning of the 20th century. Water, sewage, highways, railways, airports, all of it. We are paying compensation for the invasion of Kuwait. We have to pay 55 billion, more than $55 billion. The debts we inherited from Saddam regime was over $150 billion. We have to pay all those money, and we have to rebuild our country. Now, we give priority to those countries who stood with us who help Iraq and the Iraqi people to get rid of Saddam dictatorship and to build democracy, human rights, rule of law, women rights, etc., etc. And I will give you a few examples of what happened in new Iraq. In our constitution, we put an article which said that 25% of our parliament members should be women. That's a good percentage comparing with many countries in the world, including the United States, let alone comparing with countries in the region. And when we adopted that constitution in 2005, some countries in the region were not allowing women to vote, let alone to run for office. And those laws were changed after Iraq and now women were allowed, and some of them became members of parliaments in other neighboring countries or regional countries. So we, um, as recently, I've seen a good statement by some politician and journalists who say Iraq was the beginning of what we called Arab Spring. When Saddam dictatorship was toppled in Iraq and we start to have elections, the first time I voted in my life was in 2005. Do you remember the ink stand fingers raised to the media um, in 2005? It was the first country in the Middle East which went from dictatorship to democracy and they have elections. Every Iraqi participant, they feel that they have a say in the government. And now you can see Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, many countries are following suit. Yes, they're saying that the American army came to Iraq to remove Saddam regime. Okay. But what happened in Iraq inspired many nations in the region and maybe in the world. And so many other issues. Until today, some European countries have worse laws for women. Like some European countries, if a woman gets married with a man who is not from that country, he will not get citizenship. But if a man gets married with a woman, she will get the citizenship. This is discrimination against women, isn't it? And I know that because I work in the UN. I know many colleagues, women, who complain about laws in their countries. And this law, the law was during Saddam regime. An Iraqi child should be born for an Iraqi parents, a father and a mother before he gets in. The law changed. Now, any woman, any Iraqi woman has a child. The child has the right to have Iraqi citizenship. 
women were not allowed to serve in any diplomatic mission, Iraqi mission outside Iraq. Why? Because all of them were intelligence with weapons who should attack opposition and try to kill. And we find weapons in each single embassy, including our embassy in New York, in the mission. Machine guns, hand grenades, explosives, silencers, because Saddam regime was all about intelligence. The Libyan embassy in London, they killed a, a woman, a police woman, British police woman, when there was a demonstration against the Libyan, they shot her from the window and the Britain just, the, the UK government only asked them to leave because they couldn't do anything for them. They have diplomatic immunity. But they shot a police woman from the window. So these dictators, they always have weapons because they feel threatened, they feel vulnerable. They are unpopular among the people of their country. So here we are, Iraq is going to be an ally for the US for a long time. We're going to have strategic alliance, and we're going to fight terrorism together because terrorists came to Iraq after 2003 under the pretext that there is a US occupation, and we have to have a resistance, and we have to fight, fight Americans, American puppets who are the Iraqi government. But what about the car bombs which was planted in markets and streets? Does it kill only Iraqi officials or does it kill civilians? It kills civilians. What about Sunni and Shia? Does a car distinguish between a Sunni and a Shia, between a Kurd and an Arab, between a Muslim and a Christian? When you put a car bomb in a market or a street, it kills anybody. These terrorists, terrorists justify killing everybody. I published two books about terrorism. One called Tourism Game about Osama bin Laden and 9-11. And I study their religious thoughts. Another book about tourism in Iraq, about Abbas Abu Zarqawi, who was the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And they justify killing everybody except themselves. They put under every human being certain banner to be killed. The Christians are infidels who deserve to be killed. The Jews are infidels. The Shiites are infidels. The Kurds are infidels. The Sunni, or even the Sunni, they are fellow sect people, are lenient with the regime or lenient with the new government. They should fight. They should have jihad, holy war. So they are good. Otherwise, they are justified to be killed. So they end up justifying killing everybody, including babies. And this is what happened over the world. And this is a cancer, by the way. 50 years ago, there was no Qaeda. It started in Afghanistan, and then spread all over the world. Now we have it in Mali. We used to have it in Somalia, in Yemen, in Indonesia, in Bali. 9-11, Europe, London, Spain is going everywhere, by the way. And those who said that American troops shouldn't go to Afghanistan, or shouldn't have gone to Afghanistan, shouldn't have gone to Iraq, let me remind them. Because we forget. When Al-Qaeda attacked American troops in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh and Al-Khubra, and they killed American soldiers, did the United States went to Afghanistan? No. When they attacked Yemen, USS call in Yemen, they killed sailors, did America Go to Afghanistan? No. When they attack American embassy in Nairobi, in Tanzania, in many places in the world, did the American go immediately to Afghanistan? No. When Al-Qaeda attacked in 9-11 and killed 3,500 soldiers, the American went the next day to Afghanistan? No. They asked Taliban regime to hand over Osama bin Laden who claim responsibility for 9-11 and Taliban regime refused. So what do you want the US government to do? Wait until we have another 9-11 which could be similar or worse, to have two, three 9-11s, five, 10, 20, before they take action? And by the way, what the US forces were doing in Riyadh and Khobar when they were attacked by Al-Qaeda, they were there to liberate Kuwait from Saddam invasion. It's not the American who went all the way to the Gulf because they like to do that. It wasn't a journey. It wasn't a tourist mission. It was a mission to liberate a country which was occupied 
unjustly by Saddam. So it was Saddam who caused all this problem. Those who defend Saddam regime today, everywhere in the world, whether it's in the Arab media or the Western media, those who said we shouldn't have gone to Iraq, Saddam was supporting terrorism. Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, was acting in Iraq during Saddam regime time, and I prove that in my book. Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi from Iraq planned the killing of American diplomat in Jordan. Go and Google Lawrence Foley. This is a diplomat in Amman who was killed by Al-Qaeda in Iraq during Saddam regime in 2001. So, my conclusion is that the United States didn't go to Afghanistan to take Taliban regime off, and they didn't go to Iraq to take Saddam regime off, until they felt that these two regimes, which we call them rug regimes, they were a real threat, not only to you as citizen, but to peace and security in the world, because they attack in 9-11, they attack in London, they attack in Madrid, they attack in mid the Middle East, they attack in East Asia, they attack everywhere. And we don't, if we don't unite to fight this cancer, this cancer will be spreading over everywhere. So we have to unite to fight extremism and terrorism and to defend human rights to defend people who are oppressed by dictators, by a single person or a family or a party, a single party, to have democracy, human rights, rule of law, and other human principles and values. Because we, the citizen who love peace, have principles, whether these principles come from our holy books we believe in, our holy prophets we believe in, or the laws of democracy and the free countries in the world. Thank you very much for this opportunity. The most uh, vilified president uh, in my lifetime was George W. Bush for uh, taking us into uh, Iraq and uh, the subject of we weapons of mass destruction, of course. Now, uh, it appears to me that we've freed Iraq, and Iraq is well on its way to democracy. However, we're getting a lot of uh, newspaper reports regarding I Iraq's uh, relationship with Iran. And we, are, we see Iran as a potential threat. What I'd like to know is, in your opinion, should a conflict break out between the U.S. and Iran. And that conflict will break out if Iran gets into a conflict with Israel. Where does the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people stand? In 2003, Iran agreed to freeze enrichment of uranium for two years. This is well-documented facts. Between 2003 and 2005, which is not far away, 10 years ago, Iran agreed to freeze the enrichment of uranium, not for a month, not for six months, not for, for two years. What happened? We ignored them and we forget them. Then they resume enrichment, and when we try to free, they said, no, not anymore. You see? This is politics games, by the way. And I'm not in a position to assess why on earth the West, and here not only the US, it's the Security Council, the P5, it's all the countries, it's Europe. When they agree to freeze, they have a reactor, and they need uranium for that reactor. And this is their right, according to the NPT. Any country, any member state has the right to have nuclear powers for civilian use. And they were ready to freeze enrichment. Okay, the second occasion, there was this agreement that we will take all the uranium they enrich above 3% or 5%, and we will give them enriched uranium to be used in civilians' purposes, such as medical uses or electricity or whatever. And again, something happened. 
I know for a fact today that Iran is ready because of the sanction to limit their enrichment to a certain level in return of lifting the sanction. But the problem sometimes when we talk to countries, and I'll be here very frank, we believe that they should do what we want them to do. We don't believe that they are equal to us. We are a superpower, we're going to force them. While in politics, when you sit like in, in the UN, a member state's a member state. You have small islands of 5,000 people, and they have the same vote of the United States of 300 million with the superpower, with the huge. You need to deal with countries, small countries, the same with Iraq, you know. I was deputy foreign minister, sometimes the American service say, no, you cannot go through my checkpoint. This is my checkpoint. You know what I mean? I said, I'm a deputy foreign minister. Do you have a visa? He said, no. He said, you shouldn't be in my country. This is my country. <laughs> so the mentality when you engage countries is that you should consider them as a sovereign because this is what the UN Charter is all about. The sovereignty, territorial integrity, the unity of member states. Now, with Iran, I think there is still a way before they become North Korea. And North Korea is too late. The intelligence report tested in the newspapers that they have the capability of a small nuclear bomb which could be sent in a missile. They could deny it, it could be a cover, it could be true, I don't know. But we waited too long until it's too late. And you know, just like I'm talking about Al-Qaeda, which is a cancer, if you leave the cancer too late, you cannot get rid of it. If you diagnose it and treat it in the beginning, it's recoverable. My name is Fred Saleh. I was born in Iraq, and I'm of the Jewish faith. I would like to ask you, now that you're compensating Kuwait, will there be any possibilities that the property that were confiscated from the Jewish people in Iraq, there were 150,000 of us prior to Saddam Hussein, will ever be uh, realized? Okay, I have uh, Jewish Iraqi friends in New York. When I lived in London, I had Iraqi Jewish friends. And uh, the Iraqi Jews were part of the Iraqi society for centuries. And um, I received a letter from a, a Jewish professor, Karol Basri, who teach law in Pennsylvania University that we've heard that Iraq is rebuilding a shrine for a prophet, a Jewish prophet in Iraq, and they're removing the Hebrew writings. So I wrote to Baghdad, and Baghdad replied that we are refurbishing the shrine because it's an old, and we don't remove the Hebrew writings. But I didn't stop there. I went to Baghdad, I took a car, I drove for more than two hours to go to the shrine myself and to see with my own eyes what's going on. And the same day, uh, so the same day I arrived, I saw they are uh, putting concrete on the floor, and the guy in charge showed me the Hebrew writings. He said, how we remove the Hebrew writings? It will lose all its um, you know, historical importance. And he said, this shrine was closed during Saddam regime time, so nobody could go inside. And as a result, you know, when you leave a, a building which is already 3,000 years old, it's become so derelict. So they are refurbishing it, they are. Now with the properties, by the way, the lawyer of our Iraqi mission is an Iraqi Jew in New York, in Manhattan, Jack Shakachi. Shakachi is very well. I know him. Well, you know him. Okay, good. You can ask Jack how much I um, perish our relation uh, and he's like uh, a brother to me. And he talked to me about property. I told him, listen, get me any deed for any property owned by a Jewish Iraqi, and I will try to get it back to him. And the government, the prime minister actually, set up a special committee to look into either returning properties, because we have a committee which look into every property which was either confiscated by Saddam regime or was occupied by people illegally either to give it back to the owner or to compensate that owner. And the government announced from time to time how much money she, the government paid for those who either occupied or take properties or it was confiscated by the government. So as long as the ownership is to that person, 
Yes, whether he's a Jew or any other religion or any group in Iraq, an Iraqi person, an Iraqi citizen deserve to have his property back. Do okay? you think an Iraqi Jew would be safe to go now to Iraq and try if, to reclaim his properties? If an Iraqi go back to Iraq... Uh, an Iraqi Jew. Regardless, because people wouldn't ask you. I lived in Iraq until today when I go back to Iraq. L let me tell you this story just to, to make you feel sure what I'm saying. You know, when I, I was born in a Muslim family, when my father put me in a Christian private school when I was four years old, in a pre-K and kindergarten classes. And I used to go to the church because this school is part of the church and the hospital. And I used to go to the church. I was fascinating and with the church and the high ceiling. And there was a statue with his hand like that, and you put a coin and it will bend to you. So every day I was forcing my family <laughs> to give me some coins because I didn't figure out how this statue knew that I put the coin and he bent. It's the weight which I didn't calculate. And my family never said, why did you go to the church? You are a Muslim, you shouldn't go to the church. And when I was a teenager, and this is a true story, believe me, a businessman walked into my father's office, and when he left, he said, son, this guy is a Jew. And when you do business with Jews, they are trustworthy people, and they are straightforward people. You see? And then later on, I start to read the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, even the Tanakh, which is the, which, by the way, I gave my book to an ambassador of the UN, said, what is the Tanakh? I said, the Tanakh is the Jewish Bible. He said, is it not the Old Testament? I said, no, you have to educate yourself, okay? Because <laughs> not every ambassador read all these holy books. So I realized that my father brought me up in a way to feel that a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew are the same. More than that, he, he didn't tell me that Muslims are good people and trustworthy people and stuff. He told me Jews are good people. Why is that? Because he was doing business with Jews, and this is his real feeling about Jews in Iraq. And you know what happened? You know, the Jews did immigrate from Iraq following 1948 establishment of Israel because they were happy in Iraq. You that's know right. that story. That's I don't 100%. want to tell it. All right? Oh, we so were happy for 3,000 years. if you go back to Iraq, as an Iraqi, I don't think you will be hurt. The terrorist groups who are attacking Jews, Christians, and Muslims, they target all of us because they don't distinguish between us. A car bomb doesn't distinguish between a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew. But I can assure you, don't go. If you have a property, let me help you to get it back, okay? Well, Mr. Ambassador, on behalf of the Ocean Lifelong Learning Institute, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>